Today's sermon is about doubt, doubt part two. Doubting God is a very dangerous thing. Let's read a historical event, event in the Bible that happened over doubt. It's always good to, uh, to read the word about a situation. The setting. Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God. So he's not doubting God. He's up there talking to him, okay? And he's, and he's been gone a while. He's been gone a long time. Matter of fact, the children of Israel are beginning to wonder if Moses is coming back. In Exodus 32, 1 through 5, it says, Now the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. The people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come make gods that shall go before us. For as for Moses, this Moses, the one who brought us up out of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So there's doubt there, right? So all the people broke off the golden earrings, excuse me, and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Now keep in mind, there's millions of them. Imagine how many gold, how much gold even a million people would bring just with the smallest of earrings, right? So here's all these people of Israel bringing all this gold. It must have been, I mean, it must have been a, a, a mountain of gold, okay? You know, probably, who knows, 100 pounds of gold. I don't know what it was. And this was gold that God gave them. This was the wealth of Israel that Egypt took that, that God gave back to the children. Do you understand? Do you see that? Well, he, he took, they said he took the wealth of Egypt with them. So they're taking something that God gave them and using it in their doubt. And I see it a lot of times where people are all about God and then as soon as things get a little bit better and they get their they get up a little bit and they get their gold upright and everything's good, they don't even show up to church no more. So some catastrophe brings them back. You know, they, they only they only go to God like, like most children go to their parents, right? When they need something. So I guess that's natural. But is it godly? No, it's not godly. True success is to use what God gave you for what God wants you to use it for. Amen? So Aaron, Moses' own brother, and you can just explain where Aaron's mindset is. Aaron knows he's not Moses and never even pretended to be Moses, all right? Aaron always knew his position. God never gave him a set staff to do any miracles. All Aaron was was a good orator. He could talk. Well, Moses was a pretty good orator too. He just was scared. Well, that's, another, that's another subject. So Aaron is scared that these people are going to try to make him into Moses. So the first thing he does is offer a way for him to get out of that, right? Let's make a let's make a golden calf, right? You worship the calf, not me. I don't want to be Moses. So Aaron, in a way, is covering himself, but he's in doubt too. Because if he believed what his brother was preaching, he'd have told him to wait, right? He'd have took up and said, hey, oh, no, 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 we're going to wait on the Lord. But no, he did not. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. As this started out, the people were not asking to change who their God was. But because of their doubt in God, because they looked to a man as their God, Moses being him, and now he had disappeared. Moses was gone. They knew where he went. In doubt and fear, they went to Aaron, who they believed would side with them, and he did, and make them something 
they can see and touch. Let me tell you something. People will always see your weakness. They'll, I don't care where you stand, what position you're given, people are always seeing your weakness. If you're weak on God on any level, that's where Satan's coming after you. You understand that? That's where Satan's coming to get you. In doubt and fear, they went to Aaron, who believed would side with them, as we just said, and make them something they could see and touch. This golden cap was their idea of what God should look like. That's what they thought. That's what they were used to in Egypt, right? Animals that turn into gods. They weren't changing gods, so they thought. Remember, Aaron said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. So they're still, they're just trying to make their own image of God. Do you see that? And as is usual form, one sin leads to another. Then they started throwing a party that included all the usual sins when people are disobedient at a party. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I'm sure. Amen. So as we see here, doubt turned into horrific sin. It took the blessing away from Israel. Doubt always takes the blessing away from you. Amen. It always removes the possibilities of the possible. It always leaves you with the impossible. <laughs> Doubt is a sickness. It is a sin and it is directly from hell. Amen. When you know who you are, it doesn't matter what someone else says. Amen. <laughs> When you know who your God is, it don't matter. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like. Because somehow, some way, he's going to shine through it. Amen. It's not time to, to run and hide. It's time to get strong and bold and start praising him. In the, as the song says, praise you in the storm. <laughs> Ironically, when Moses came down from the mountain of God, one of the commands specifically said, Thou shalt not make idols. Our graven images. You see how quick Satan went to work? He had them sinning even before Moses came down with the commandment. What we do when we doubt even the smallest nature of God's word is we try to mold God into what we think he should be. And I've seen it. I had a guy that worked for me and we rode up. We had to run up to Mandara and do something. And he was telling me that we were talking, not, not so I took the opportunity to, to kind of ease the word of the Lord in there without, you know, jumping over a, too, too hard on him. And boy, he just cut loose and started telling me how God was and how he believed God was. And basically the way he believed he, God was, he could do anything he wanted to do. Well, that's what the Israels believe, right? As soon as they made their way to what God was, they started having sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They started sinning, having orgies and everything else. Sin nature took over. There's only one God. There's only one way to worship Him. And that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. There is no other way. We can make Him any way we want. We can, we can, we can, we can cover and camouflage and do what we want. But we're still going to go to hell for it. It doesn't matter how we do it. What matters is who we do it with. Amen? So that's what the children of Israel did. They just converted God to what worked for them, right? To them, the golden calf was an attempt to redefine the true nature of God and control him according to their fears and desires. Fear and doubt called absolute betrayal to Moses and God by the children of Israel. They turned a little doubt. It started with, I wonder where Moses is. Oh, he'll be down here in a little bit. Then that person, I wonder where Moses is. Next thing you know, there was no Moses. Right? Next thing you know, there was no God. God's abandoned us. Where's Moses? There was no God to them. And don't think it's not possible for us to get in doubt just like they did because we do it all the time. When the doctor says a bad report, when the IRS is at your door, when your money stops coming in, when you suffer horrific loss, these are times a lot of people do some pretty desperate things. Some people drink and take drugs. 
Some steal. Some even take their own life. Some lash out against God and even people they love, who they need the most in those darkest times because they traded their God for, for anguish and depression. You know, depression and self-pity is a God too. You know that, right? Some people desire that. It's all doubt in God. When you truly know God, there's nothing to be depressed about. Because you know what's on the other side. You know, amen. You know you share eternal life. You know who you are. There is nothing to be depressed about if you truly know God. The situation may not be okay, but your God is always okay. Amen. You can dress it up any way you want, but it's betrayal to God by us. Example, where is God? Where is Moses? He abandoned me. God won't forgive me or God doesn't love me. God doesn't hear my prayers. Any of that sound familiar? Amen. How could God forgive me? Easy. Jesus already did it. That's how he did it. Amen. Doubt is a cancer that can destroy everything it touches. Doubt is the base of atheism. Right? Doubt is fear. If the devil can make you doubt God, he can have you. Doubt will not let you look at the bright side of anything. Doubt is angry and temperamental. You show me a temperamental person, I'll show you a person who lives by fear and doubt. They doubt because it's easier to doubt than be wrong or let down or proven wrong. It's a form of fear. It's, a, it's the fear of having faith in something or someone. So we become demi-gods. I only believe in what I, I, I just believe in myself. I don't need nobody else. Well, I've heard that too many times. And then when they do need somebody else, here they come like a puppy dog. They don't need somebody else till they need somebody else. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's what happens with people that need God. Oh, everything's going wrong. As soon as God gets them out of that situation, you don't even know what happened to them. Where they, you know, it's like they vanished. It's like God already took them to heaven or something. They're gone. Where'd they go? They were translated to the Holy of Holy. Where'd they go? They must be there. Up there with Elijah, right? Amen. The person didn't start out like that. None of us started out in fear or doubt. Matter of fact, we started out full of confidence. This person started out as a fireman or a doctor, a policeman, a nurse, maybe even the world's greatest carpenter or mechanic like their dad or grandpa, right? A school teacher like their mother. They started out with full confidence as a child. They used to play that. They used to play, I'm the doctor and the nurse and, and the, the, with their cars and toys and and whatever, they play acted everything they were, right? They believed it till the world showed them different. Till doubt came in and taught them lessons that they maybe they couldn't be what they wanted to be. Maybe they weren't good enough for God. So no longer were they people of faith, they become people of doubt. They were faith people at one time. But the generational curse of doubt came into their life and taught them doubt through personal experience, right? Through personal bad experience. Once they lost hope, they lost faith. So pride replaced fear as a barrier between them and disappointment. That's what pride is. Pride is fear, and it's a barrier between disappointment. That's all it is. But the good news is we have Jesus. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? There's nothing that we can't conquer through Christ Jesus. Doubt is Satan's greatest weapon against God. All Satan wants you to do, wants you to see is the impossible. That's all. Only see the impossible. Can't be done, especially by you. It's impossible. But God never shows up until it is impossible to finish the job for us. Amen? You got to take it to the impossible to get the possible. Amen? 
Sometimes people don't even believe God wants the best for them. Boy, you need to hear these words. Now let's, they don't even believe the word of God when it says he became poor so that we could become rich in every way. I didn't say that. The word of God said that. Now let's talk about doubt and prosperity for the believer. If you don't believe in prosperity, then you can't go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven. In heaven, the streets are paved with gold. The gates are made out of pearl. Everything there is prosperity. Amen? Amen. Everything. Amen? If you don't believe in prosperity, how are you going to live in the mansion God prepared for you and walk on the streets paved with gold? How are you going to do it? What are you going to say to Jesus? I don't believe in prosperity. I can't have this house you prepared for me. Then Jesus will say, if you don't believe in the promises of prosperity for my father, then you can go to hell. Because hell is all you have left. If that's what you believe. There's nothing else. There's no, there's nothing here that isn't prosperity. What else could he say? What else could Jesus say? There's no options there, right? Some will say, don't store your treasures here. Save them for the sweet by and by. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, guess what? We did inherit the earth. Amen? We're here. Hallelujah. We talked about this in the, the Godfathers meeting the other day. The word meek in the original Greek means a bridled war horse ready for battle. And meek does not mean weak. Amen? We inherited the earth. So when did, we, when did we inherit the earth? We inherited the earth when Jesus came out of that grave and defeated hell itself. That's when we inherited the earth. Not sometime in the future, because in the future, we won't need to inherit the earth. We're going we're gonna to have paradise. Why would we want this? Amen? The perplexity of faith will sometimes make the proper gospel invisible because of doubt. Let me say that again. The perplexity of faith will sometimes make the proper gospel invisible because of doubt. Example, it's so good it's hard to believe. It's just too good to be true, right? A perplexity of faith will make the gospel invisible because of doubt. There is doubt in those words. It's too good to be true. There's no way God wants me to be successful. It's not possible that God wants me to prosper. I'm not supposed to, to do good. I'm not supposed to be able to pay for my kid's college. I'm not supposed to be able to make sure that my house has a good roof on it. I'm not sure to make sure that I have a house. Amen? So yes, it is too good to be true if you don't know Jesus. Amen? Yeah, a lot of things are too good to be true. But when you know the King of Kings... Your kingdom people. This all belongs to you. It's God's will. So we choose to live in lack when God is the God of abundance. We have turned the word poverty into a holy Sunday word called piety. So now we are supposed to be holy because we live in poverty. Something sound wrong with all that? So we have twisted God to the image that suits our personal desires, fears, and situations. This is no different than Aaron and the with the Israelites making a graven image of the bull. It's just converting God to the way that you need to see him to make it work for you so you keep doing what you're doing or not doing what you're doing. Amen. Instead of adjusting their faith, they adjusted God to the situation and made the golden calf. They wanted a God. They just wanted a God that agreed with them, with their way of doing things. So if our wonderful father wants us poor, what's next? He wants us sick? He wants our children sick? Do you look at your little child and want your child sick? Would you not trade in for a second their sickness and take it with you? Well, who is our father? We're made his exact image. How many deathly sick and broke people do you see running around the world 100% evangelizing and spreading the word of God? You don't see it because they can't do it. 
If you can't even afford the bus to get across town, how are you going to get to Africa and evangelize those people? No, it takes resources. It takes prosperity. It takes brothers and sisters with prosperity to give into that evangelism and to have enough to support the evangelists so they can do these things. And it takes divine health. You can't drink the water over there and you can't eat the food. You better be healthy. You better have enough resources to take a couple things with you too. Quit judging yourself where you are at instead of where you should be. Quit it. Quit judging God by where you're at instead of where you should be. Quit making that graven image in your mind and start living by faith on the Word of God and come out of it. Come out of it. Come out of poverty. Come out of mentality. Come out of that loneliness. Come into Jesus. It's time to get up. We've had enough being beat down. It's time to rise. Rise, Jesus. Sometimes we need to be brought to the end of our wits so that we can be brought to the beginning of our knees. Amen. Hallelujah. We won't get on our knees until God puts us down on our knees. Until there's no way to go but up. Amen. And that's a good place to be. It don't matter where you're at right now. What matters is what you do now forward. Amen. Today is the day of change. Today is the day of the King of Jesus. Amen. We will not be broken down anymore. We will rise. We will rise and we will rise. We are kingdom men and women. We will not, be, we will not bow to poverty. We will not bow to sickness. And we sure ain't going to bow to hell. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes we need to be brought to the end of our wits so that we can be brought to the beginning of our faith. Hallelujah. It starts at the end so we get to the top. God is a is is he he forwards us. He doesn't hold us back. Amen. The Israelites were always going forward until they bowed to hell. Then they went in circles. Amen. We don't go in circles, we go forward. We are in the promised land. Hallelujah. We inherited the earth. The end of our wits is not a roadblock. I didn't say stay there. Amen. It's the highway to faith and godly abundance. Don't believe in can't. Believe in Jesus. That's who you need to believe in. Thomas was the most famous doubter in the Bible. Doubting Thomas. Don't be a Thomas. Say, I don't doubt. I do not doubt. I do not doubt. I will never doubt. In God. In God. Amen. Amen. I heard a great definition of faith. It said, go as far as you can and then take one more step. Amen. What the Israelites do, they went as far as they can and they wouldn't take that step, right? They didn't get to the promised land, did they? But the next generation took the step and guess what? They crossed on dry ground. Amen. Amen. They went over there. They went through the river, not over it, amen, on dry ground. Sometimes we doubt because we fear persecution from others. Oh, I don't know what my friends are going to think if I start, start speaking holy. If I start talking Jesus, what are they going to think? Let me, give you, let me tell you a secret. God is willing to bless you beyond your wildest dreams if you're willing to take the persecution of it. Beyond your wildest dreams. Read that again to you. God is willing to bless you beyond your wildest dreams if you're willing to take the persecution of it beyond your wildest dreams. <laughs> Example. That brother and sister so-and-so must be up to no good because they sure have too much success. Amen. That's a persecution. Boy, I'd rather hear that than, boy, they sure are they sure are nice and poor. They must really love the Lord. I, I, I definitely prefer the other. Look at them and they call themselves Christians. You ever heard that? They call themselves Christians. They believe they can plant a seed and receive a harvest. They believe God wants to prosper them. Show them. That brother and sister, so-and-so are extremists. They believe in that faith stuff. 
right? They believe that they can plant a seed and receive a harvest. Shame on them. They believe God wants to prosper them. Shame on them. God don't prosper nobody. Shame on the person that says that. Look at brother and sister so-and-so. They believe God will heal them. Don't they know that God makes his children sick to teach them holiness? That doctrine straight from hell. God does not do that. You have to be willing to take the persecution from the doubters in order to receive your prosperity in Christ. But always remember, prosperity and op is an opportunity for testimony and giving, not gluttony and greed. Okay? Remember what prosperity in God is, what prosperity from Christ is. It's not for selfish purposes. It's for the purpose of the kingdom of God. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Amen? Hallelujah? The new is here. We have been reborn into a new creation. We have been reborn from the curses of this world. Jesus redeemed us from the curse. We don't live by the curse. We won't accept the curse. And we won't receive the curse because we receive Jesus. Hallelujah. The Word of God says that He became poor so we could be rich. The Word of God says that He took our infirmities and bore our sickness. These words aren't mine. They come straight out of the Word of God. So the naysayers need to read their Bible. Quit naysaying. Amen. Hallelujah. Just because someone acts like they are holier than thou is the first clue that they aren't. All right? Remember that. Never let anyone put doubt of the Word of God in you. Anyone. No matter how holy they seem, if they're saying healing in from God, then guess what? They're not holy at all. Amen? Because they don't know the Word of God. You are supposed to be successful and you're supposed to be healthy. How do we know? Because the Word says it's so. Amen? Amen? Jesus says he didn't come so some people could be healthy. Jesus says he didn't come, he didn't become poor so just a few could be rich. No, he said we anyone that belongs to the King of Kings has this blessing on their life. Yes. Doubt gives you mental anemia. It causes depression and mental illness. It drains your strength and willpower out of you. It is the destroyer. I'd rather be a religious fanatic than be out of faith. Amen? We must watch what we hear, what we read, and what we say. Because we get what we say and believe for. I believe in the word of faith, even though some say it doesn't work, but that's their problem, not mine. Of course it doesn't work for them. They're saying it don't work, so it don't work. Amen? The bottom line is either they are lying or God is lying. And I'm pretty sure I know which one's doing the lying. Amen? It ain't going to be God. Remember, the holier-than-thou person is the first clue that they are not holier-than-thou. They're probably not holy at all. They probably go home and beat their wife and everything else. You don't know what they're doing behind closed doors. But if they're speaking doubt in God, they're doing something wrong. Don't believe the junk. Only believe the word of faith, the word of God. Amen? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Speak only faith. Hallelujah. When our faith is weak, it interferes with our judgment. It even suspends our judgment. We can't even make a right decision when our faith is weak. Doubt will not look at the bright side of anything, but purpose-driven faith will bring the light in the darkness. Amen. Spiritual progress will only be obtained through strong belief. It will never be obtained through doubt. There will be no spiritual progress when you doubt in the majesty and the power and the glory of Jesus. Faith walks on water, but fear makes you sink. Amen? Hallelujah. This is a water walk. And how about that? Amen? Amen. When you focus with faith on your priority, you overcome your obstacles. 
Even in a weak state, faith can overcome fear. Sometimes we're weak. Sometimes we're so weak, we can barely stand. Some tragedy has come on our lives. A loved one's lost. Uh, we lost our jobs. A kid's not doing well. We don't know where a child is. I mean, all kind of things can come on us when we're weak. But it, that doesn't interfere with faith. Do you understand that? Faith says, I believe in God and I'll get through this. Amen? So don't put what you feel like as a reality of what God is. Because your feelings have nothing to do with God. Amen. The reality is the Word of God. That's what has something to do with God. When you speak the Word of God, things change, things bend, things happen. Amen. And listen, you don't have to be a mountain climber to walk up a hill, okay? It doesn't take that kind of skill to make it up a hill, okay? You just have to put one foot in front of the other until you get to the top. Amen. Now I'm going to close today with one perfect example of how to live and walk in faith and not in doubt. Why was Jesus so successful? Because he only said what the Father said, and he only did what the Father said to do. Amen? Hallelujah. If anyone here doesn't know Jesus or has just fallen away, please repeat these few powerful words after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you into my heart. I now make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Let's all rise. Father God, we come to you and we thank you for this opportunity today that you gave us, Father God, to worship you and love you and praise you, Father God. And we're going to continue to praise you, Father God. As the song says, we praise you in the storm, Father God, and we praise you in the sunshine too. And we thank you, Father God. Only you know what's on the other side of the storm, Father, not us. Father God, we ask you to be with everyone here and bless those as they go. And bless our children as they go back to school this coming week, Father God. And we thank you for what you give to us, Father God, and the blessings that we have. May we be mighty warriors in your son, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God.